Ladies and gentlemen, um, 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 members of the SID Scientific Committee um, and uh, the President of the SID, Angela Cristiano, um, I am absolutely humbled to be standing in front of you giving Eugene Farber a lecture. Um, and um, I actually met um, Dr. Farber um, in the early 90s when I was working with um, Brian Nikoloff at the University of Michigan um, doing some uh, work on uh, towards my doctorate thesis um, and uh, for, for those of you who don't know Brian Nikoloff um, had also had worked with um, Eugene Farber at Stanford before moving to Michigan um, and so I sometimes think I'm one step removed from Eugene Farber um, and uh, um, hopefully have been able to carry on some of the important work that he did in um, psoriasis. Now, at the time, my, my work was relating to um, skin immunology and identifying immune mechanisms, particularly adhesion molecules and chemotactic cytokines, um, as mechanisms of skin inflammation and relating it to potentially skin diseases. But gradually, um, as time went by, I became more interested in the concept of what specifically causes disease. In other words, not from mechanisms to disease, but from disease to mechanisms. Um, and it seemed to me um, that a better approach uh, would be genetics. And in the early 90s, um, genetic approaches were starting to be used to uh, uh, investigate common complex disease, uh, providing that there was evidence that there were indeed genes involved. Um, and it's therefore apt in many ways uh, that this should be um, the subject um, of my uh, uh, talk for the Eugene Farber uh, lecture uh, because one of the oft quoted papers, the seminal papers on genetic epidemiology of psoriasis uh, providing uh, robust data that there is an, indeed an important genetic component uh, came from Eugene Farber um, and as you can see from the, the main statement the striking difference in concordance rates for psoriasis between monozygotic and dizygotic twins uh, twin pairs indicates that there's a heritable contribution to the etiology of the disease. Um, well, it's taken a while, uh, but hopefully this area of common complex disease um, genetics and the skin um, is, is now really mature. Um, and just before I talk specifically um, about psoriasis, um, there are, it, it hasn't, these methods have in fact helped a, a range of inflammatory diseases. And I think that major insights uh, towards their pathogenesis have been derived from these studies and indeed translating into new treatments. Uh, the work of your president, um, um, Angela Cristiano and Alopecia Ariata, um, and genes and Janus kinase is now being used, inhibitors now being used in the clinic for alopecia areata is a very good example of that. And the explosion of interest in atopic dermatitis um, has again in great part um, been led by um, genetic studies, um, translation to new drugs. Um, acne um, is something that we're actively working on as you can see from the Manhattan plot in the bottom left. Um, there are several um, peaks of association with severe acne vulgaris in pathways not previously thought to be relevant but biologically interesting like wind signaling um, and laminin um, and hopefully you'll be hearing more about that now uh, in, in, you'll be hearing more about that in, in um, the months ahead um, but the, the subject of my talk today um, is psoriasis. Now just before I start talking about the disease I thought um, it, uh, some perhaps more cynical people think, why do you need to study psoriasis anymore? Haven't you resolved it with biological therapy? And it's undoubtedly true that biological therapies have led to a ma major advances um, in, in, um, in, in uh, the treatment of psoriasis. Uh, we ordered it, I know this is not something you, you do too much in the US as admit patients, um, but if you look at the panel on the right, we ordered our practice before and after the introduction of biologic therapies with respect to inpatients, which is a hard, a hard measure of outcome. And inpatient episodes for, our, for severe psoriasis have gone down by over 80%. And I think if we were to repeat that audit now, it's probably gone down by probably 95%, to be honest. Um, but that biologics are not the answer to everything. Um, they are very expensive. Um, most patients have mild to moderate disease. Um, even the market leaders um, are not 100% effect, effective 100% of the time. 
Um, indeed, um, as we've shown um, through our national registry in the United Kingdom in the bottom panel there, uh, drug survival curves um, uh, are, are not a, a flat line and indeed there's about a 15% drop off per annum. Um, so in other words, that the effect of these agents diminishes with time. Um, they are not so effective in clinical variants um, and there are adverse events associated with them. So I just le leave that thought with you so that I think that there is an, uh, a, a significant unmet need remaining and there's more to do. And I think genetics can help a lot with, uh, with this. So, why, so with, with respect to psoriasis, why, why do we need to, uh, to do genetics? Well, we need to understand disease mechanisms. We need to identify new drug pathways. Uh, we need to understand the environmental factors. And if we had a level genetic playing field, understanding uh, the environment would be a lot e uh, the environmental factors would be a lot easier. Um, we have very little understanding of the natural history of the disease, who's going to get severe disease and who isn't, who's going to progress to psoriatic arthritis and who isn't. And then finally, in this age of personalized um, precision medicine, um, can we stratify the disease and what role does genetics have to play in that, both in terms of phenotype and outcome. And I'm, and I'm not going to be able to go through all of these um, today in a few minutes remaining, um, but what I'll do is um, I'll do an update on where we are, um, a, a little bit about disease mechanisms, um, genetic dissection of clinical variants, um, and then a little bit about uh, what we're doing um, in the UK uh, relating to this um, SORT program um, coordinated, coordinated by uh, Chris Griffiths um, that Nicole mentioned. Um, I'm very grateful to um, Alex Soy from uh, Michigan uh, for allowing me to share um, some of his data which has just been accepted by uh, Nature Communications. So currently, with respect to Caucasian um, psoriasis, um, six, there are 63 um, loci that are statistically um, um, significantly associated with psoriasis. Um, the data that I'm going to present is based primarily on genome-wide association scans um, and meta-analysis. And in the case of Alex's study, included data derived from 39,000 um, patients with uh, uh, individuals with psoriasis. Um, as well as Caucasian studies, there's been a lot of work done in China, um, and uh, there is a significant overlap um, in terms of what's been identified, particularly those with the better, better odds ratios. Um, although most of the identified loci ha have small genetic effect, uh, they provide really quite significant insight into disease biology, as I'll show you. Um, and currently, they explain around about 30% of the heritability. Um, in other words, 70% is still missing, so there's a lot of work still to do. Um, but when thinking about psoriasis genetics, um, as a colleague of mine, Francesca Capon, says, uh, never forget the elephant in the room, which is um, um, the MHC. Um, and the, uh, the MHC uh, uh, um, is by far the major psoriasis um, uh, uh, susceptibility determinant. Uh, the heritability uh, odds ratio is between four and five, and indeed the genetic effect um, of this locus um, is greater than all other loci uh, combined. Um, within the locus, as you can see from the panel on the top right, um, there are multiple genes there and extensive li linkage to sequilibrium makes dissecting it extremely difficult. But most evidence these days um, uh, implicates that HLAC um, itself is a susceptibility um, uh, gene um, and that the causative variant is HLACW6, or as listed there with the new nomenclature. Although conditional analysis, by which I mean removing the C signal and seeing what's left, um, indicates that there are multiple um, uh, signals independent of HLAC as well. So this is really quite complex. Another interesting um, observation with respect, uh, uh, um, with respect to um, HLAC and psoriasis is a genetic interaction um, that's seen with um, ERAP1, and I'll, explain, I'll show you the, 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 um, the function of that in just a second. But if you look at the panel on the left, you can see that um, in individuals who are HLACW6 negative, um, um, there is no statistical association uh, with ERAP1. In heterozygotes and indeed in homozygotes, um, you can see that there is um, strong association between ERAP1 um, and HLAC positive um, psoriasis with really quite impressive odds ratios of around about um, 10. 
Um, and it's interesting that this occurs, um, and you can see from the panel on the right, it's also observed in another class one MHC associated disease, uh, namely um, H um, um, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and the, the variant in ERAP1 is the same for both psoriasis and ankylosing spondylitis. So why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because ERAP1 encodes in the minor peptidase re regulating the quality of peptides bound uh, to uh, class 1 MHC, um, such as uh, uh, class 1 MHC, uh, such as HLAC, um, and presenting um, antigen um, to CD8 um, positive T cells, you can see from panel A. Um, and so something is going on here around the potential role for peptide handling, both processing um, and presentation in disease susceptibility. And it also tends to suggest that in individuals who are HLA-CW6 negative, um, that completely different uh, biological mechanisms are taking place, um, um, which um, needs to be established. But uh, if we just leave the, the, the MHC to one side for a minute, what I've done in this slide is I've, I've, I've listed um, from the various GWASs um, in Caucasians, this is, um, the, top, the top 15 hits. Um, and if, forgetting the detail for a moment, uh, the interesting thing is that all of these hits uh, um, uh, revolve around very specific biological pathways. Um, so in orange, you've got the skin barrier. In pink, you've got interferon, type 1 interferon signaling. In green, you've got NF-kappa B signaling. Um, in blue, you've got interleukin-23 signaling. And in purple, you've got antigen processing and presentations, um, as I, I've already um, uh, presented. And intriguingly, as we've moved from the top 15 to 63 loci, um, the, the, the same rules continue to apply. Um, and so I think what you're seeing here is, is, is that, that, that these are the central pathways involved in psoriasis uh, pathophysiology. And as J.T. Elder has sometimes said, said uh, the psoriasis genome is an, is an immunome, and um, I think he's absolutely uh, correct. So if you then integrate it with the world of immunology and much of the very impressive immunology, psoriasis immunology uh, research that's currently ongoing, um, if, you, if you look at the panel on the right and the, the sort of scaf the immunological scaffold down the middle um, where um, the, the, the sort of usual schema is presented, uh, pathogens interfere uh, with um, uh, tissue-specific events such as inter in the skin, um, interferon signaling then occurs as Michel Gillier has investigated extensively, turning on innate immune mechanisms um, leading to um, immune signaling um, and, and activation of adaptive um, immunity. Um, and on each side of that scheme in the middle um, are the, if you like, the genetically identified um, uh, the genes, so to speak, um, which provide some specificity as to what's going on in psoriasis uh, pathophysiology. Um, and why is um, this of interest? Well, of course, um, these, uh, many of these um, uh, uh, loci um, identify potentially uh, druggable uh, targets. Um, and uh, for, the, for those of you who study psoriasis or the clinicians in the room, you'll be well aware um, of, of the explosion of biologics targeting the interleukin-23, interleukin-17 uh, pathway, which would be entirely predictable from, from this area of research. But of course, the other boxes, uh, the greens and the pinks and the oranges, um, have yet not been um, 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 investigated therapeutically, um, and um, hopefully uh, we can um, hopefully benefit from that um, in the future. Um, and one way of, of, of trying to identify new um, uh, pathways that may potentially be um, useful or druggable um, is, is given that there's 70% of the heritability uh, missing, um, is, is to, to try and find um, other loci. Um, and what this slide here is showing you um, is that, that GWAS, um, a meta-analysis of GWAS, is looking at common variation. And it's now known, to, to, uh, thanks to fuller pictures of the human genome, uh, that most human variation is actually rare um, down on the left-hand side of the, of the screen. Um, and GWAS is not a very effective tool for identifying uh, 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 low-frequency or rare variants. 
And one potentially uh, cost-effective way of doing this is, is um, uh, uh, an assay in, uh, designed by Goncalo Abacasis um, from Michigan uh, doing an exome array experiment which um, looks for low-frequency array coding um, SNPs. Um, so it's, it's a typing um, chip. Um, which we have done with JT in, Andre, uh, in Michigan and Andre Frank in uh, Kiel in Germany um, on, on uh, 11,000 cases looking for new, rare variants in new genes. Um, and uh, I have to be honest and say that the, the results have been uh, rather um, um, unrewarding and that little has been found. But one interesting curiosity came out of um, this study um, and that is um, that two genes which almost have the highest odds ratios um, outside of the MHC um, um, have multiple low frequency and rare protein coding variants um, within them. And they are IFIH1 and TIC2. Um, why are these interesting? Uh, well, these are interesting because they are involved in antiviral pathways um, and in type 1 interferon um, signaling. So there is clearly something much more proximal um, to um, um, adaptive immunity uh, going on in psoriasis, um, which is um, terribly interesting um, and also potentially druggable. And I think that's a matter of watching that space. So I just want to move on to clinical stratification um, and um, uh, talk about um, uh, pustular psoriasis. Um, I'll, I'll leave this slide now because I think time is short. Um, and that, and uh, it's now clear that, that gene genetic methodology is being able to dissect um, the psoriasis spectrum. Um, and, and the main area where there's been really very significant progress has been in, in general in pustular forms of psoriasis, particularly generalized pustular psoriasis. Um, and since the original genetic identification that mutations in the interleukin-36 uh, receptor antagonist um, cause um, GPP, von Zumbusch, um, psoriasis, um, as we and um, um, Hervé Bachelet's group uh, discovered um, uh, in, in 2011. Um, the, the, um, we, I, we think, based on um, published studies um, and our own co cohorts, uh, together around about 300 patients, um, that, that these mutations um, uh, cause about 25% of GPP, which of course means that 75% is, is, is currently unknown. Um, these mutations, um, as you can see from the panels on the right, uh, define a particularly severe phenotype of uh, generalized pustular psoriasis. So if you, if you have these mutations, you're more likely to have early onset disease uh, and more likely to have systemic inflammation um, associated with it. Um, and but interesting study, again from the University of Michigan, uh, recently published, um, showing sustained activation of interleukin-36 in GPP, um, and this is based on transcriptomic analysis of, um, of formalin-fixed tissue. Um, it's not stated in the paper, um, but I would assume that of, I think, about the 30-odd patients studied, many of them would not have mutations in the interleukin-36 uh, receptor antagonist, but despite that, sustained activation was, was seen. So in other words, IL-36 is activated even if those particular mutations are not there. Um, what does interleukin-36 RN do? Um, well, IL-36 is part of the interleukin-1 uh, superfamily, um, and um, is involved in uh, 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 inflammatory signaling, and if the, if the um, uh, receptor antagonist um, is uh, mutated, uh, you get, um, you, you get un, uh, unopposed signaling, which leads to uh, generalized um, inflammation. Um, and this is fascinating and important, not just scientifically, but therapeutically, um, and that um, there is now a new monoclonal antibody available to interleukin-36 that's about to enter clinical trials in pustular forms of psoriasis. So in other words, what started as a genetic discovery has now been translated into um, clinical investigation uh, for patient benefit. So that just goes, with respect to interleukin-36, there's the thorny issue of psoriasis vulgaris um, because we, we looked for interleukin-36 RM mutations in psoriasis in many cases and have been unable to, to find any. But it's quite clear 
um, that there is interaction between aisle 17 and aisle uh, 36 um, and that as you can see from this slide um, it, aisle 36 is up regulated in lesional skin um, and so there is evidence that these mechanisms may be of importance to psoriasis vulgaris as well although the, these specific mutations are not seen um, and um, I would urge you to see uh, the poster uh, listed at the bottom there from our PhD student, um, Dr. Satbir uh, Mahil, who has been doing some work looking at human um, um, IL-36 knockouts um, and understanding the biology of that with um, uh, the idea of, of, say, therapeutics. So I just want to go in the last um, three or four minutes of my talk um, to talk about uh, where we might be going with... with, 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 with um, uh, some of our, our genetic, um, uh, well, uh, uh, some of our uh, psoriasis uh, research. I've, I've talked about um, gene identification, I've talked about uh, phen uh, clinical phenotype stratification, but what about the, the, the role potentially in, if you like, in pharmacogenomics, um, and can we um, identify um, uh, biomarkers um, that can help guide therapy? Um, so I'm not really asking you to read this slide. Uh, the, the point of putting this messy slide up is to make the point that there have been a large number of studies looking at genetic markers of drug outcome in psoriasis, but they're all small. There is a lack of reproducibility. They all use the candidate gene approach, um, and at best, um, they've always had a small um, effect, um, effect size. So very unlikely to be clinically um, valid. Um, in rheumatology, um, uh, GWAS uh, meta-analysis of, of SNP data has been performed on very large scales um, looking at outcomes to TNF inhibitors um, and, the, and the results have been really very um, um, un, unrewarding. Um, and as you can see from the middle panel um, uh, of a very, very large study published in Nature Communications um, last year, um, that, that makes the point at the end of the abstract uh, saying that, that, that these studies justify a refocusing of future efforts on collection of other data, uh, that means other than uh, genetic data. Um, and this brings into uh, focus uh, the need for multidimensional data um, and the, because the reasons probably why this data, uh, these, these studies haven't worked um, is that there are many, many issues that impact on outcome. Adherence to drug, um, the pharmacology of drug metabolism, comorbidity, um, and none of these have been controlled for in experiments uh, to date. And so that's what we're trying to do uh, in the UK um, in this um, national consortium, as I say, led by Chris Griffiths um, in Manchester. And what we're trying to do is to build a sustainable, multidimensional, genetic, immunological, pharmacological atlas of psoriasis um, and the impact of targeted systemic therapy. Um, there are two bioresources associated with this. Um, on the left, uh, we're doing studies, um, I guess somewhat similar to what Jim Kruger's doing um, in New York, is that we're taking um, uh, deeply phenotyped individuals, around about 300, um, and taking sequential samples both before and after biological intervention um, um, to study um, and then to, to, to be put into data warehouses. What's unique about um, um, our studies is that we have a national registry of, of real-life biologic practice for psoriasis, uh, which currently has around about 12,000 individuals uh, within it, with dense demographic and outcome data, 8,000 of which have now, to date, have had serum and DNA collected. So we can now put together um, um, pharmacology, um, um, other omic analysis on serum, um, genotype, um, and clinical uh, data. And the idea being here is to use a multidimensional um, um, analysis uh, uh, using uh, w w with individuals who know an awful lot more about this than I do, whereby you, you add, you, you do your immune monitoring, genotyping, pharmacological drug level measurement. You, you, you put this into a data warehouse, you compare it with curated data in the public domain, uh, you add in information that you specifically know about your disease um, variants, your disease endotypes, 
um, and then your drug um, ver um, endotypes. Um, and hopefully this multi-dimensional analysis uh, will lead you to answers and we hope to be putting up various metabolomic, proteomic and microbiomic data into it in the future. And um, I just want to, to finish by, by, by I, I don't have any data yet to share you because it's all in progress. But if you look at the panel on, on the left, this is real life outcome um, to of patients who have received a specific biologic. Um, and as you can see, as you move across the blue vertical line at, at zero, so, so it's before and after, you can see that there's a movement of dots uh, down uh, towards uh, uh, the parsi zero on the y-axis. In other words, uh, there's most, there is benefit for most patients receiving this drug. On the, on the right, um, this is um, pharmacological analysis, um, and you can see that that drug levels are all over the place. Some so some people have good drug levels, um, some individuals have, have poor drug levels. Um, and one of the things that, that so if you get a non-responder, what you don't know is if they're a non-responder because of the, they're not achieving adequate drug levels or they're a non-responder because that drug simply will not work in them. Um, and because of uh, what the resource we have, we can now accurately point out uh, individuals and marry up the clinical data with the, um, um, uh, bio with, the, with the pharmacology data and potentially then marry that up with the genetic data. And I've just ringed one individual here who was quite clearly a non-responder at six months, but they had good drug levels. Um, so, so, so this individual is a true non-responder and they would therefore go forward into the next round of experiments. So, um, Nicole, I'm going to finish there if I may. Um, I hope I've talked to you um, about um, psoriasis um, and genetics and towards personalized outcomes. Um, I think significant progress has been made um, in identification of susceptibility factors. Um, genetics has indeed led to advances in mechanisms, um, including potential druggable targets. Um, it's now clear that we're able to stratify uh, clinical variants of the disease and maybe the nomenclature needs to change, um, and that we're now looking towards uh, potential biomarkers of treatment response. Um, it'll be very clear to you that um, as a humble uh, clinical dermatologist, this work requires large numbers of individuals to help. Um, the chiefs amongst those um, are listed here together with our funding sources um, and a plug for our meeting in Sarasis at the end of the year. Thank you very much for your attention.